Jesus' name. Amen. I've called this message Family Matters, or Family Matters, depending on how you want to think about it. So, um, and I'm, I'll get to that in a, in a bit. But uh, first of all, I want to read you a little story. And this is, a, this is from a blog. How many know what a blog is? <laughs> well, pretty much everybody. <laughs> well, it's basically an article, but it's more of a personal article. People, people do blogs. You can, any, any of us can do them. And some people have a, a big following of people who want to hear what they have to say. And this is the case of this person, this guy named Mar Matt Walsh. He's a blogger, and a lot of people follow him and are his fans. And that gets mentioned in his, uh, in his article. So just... Uh, it's a bit long, but uh, it's a little bit entertaining. He writes this, I came across her in the beans aisle. She had a cart full of groceries, a kid riding along, and another one walking beside her. Well, he wasn't really walking so much as convulsing and thrashing about like he'd invented some bizarre, angry interpretive dance. He was upset about something, from what I gathered, it had to do with a certain lucky cereal he wished to acquire. Lucky charms, baby. But which his mother refused to purchase. I felt his pain. Poor guy. My mom never bought me sugary cereal either. Breakfast candy, she called it. She used to get us Cheerios. Breakfast cardboard, I called it. <laughs> I felt the woman's pain even more. She could bribe her kid into silence, but she was sticking to her guns. Good for her, I thought. Sure, if she'd only, met, if she'd only meet his ransom demands, <laughs> my bean purchasing experience would be a bit more pleasurable. But I was rooting for her nonetheless. Not everyone felt the same way, apparently. I'd met you a few minutes earlier. You told me you were a fan. We spoke for a moment. You seemed nice enough. Then we crossed paths again, there by the beans and the screaming toddler. I guess you thought we were friends. You thought you could confide in me your deepest thoughts. You glanced toward the mother and the kid, then at me, rolled your eyes and said in a loud voice, Man, some people need to learn how to control their bleeping kids. The lady could definitely hear you, but I guess that was your intention. You had this expression like you were expecting a high five. Yeah, put it here, dude. You really told that young mother and her three-year-old off. Nice. Is that how you thought I'd respond? What is it about me that made you think I would react that way? You're the second stranger in the last few months to say something like that to me about a mom with a tantrum-throwing toddler. Probably recognize this, uh, this scenario. Now, we, get, we have a buzz, and I have no idea what it is. It's probably nothing we can do about it, and it probably is going out into the, the world. It might, if it's this thing here. No. It's... No. It might be me. The battery sometimes does that with the batteries getting off. So th this is kind of about family because, uh, well, I'm going to talk about that in a second. I guess I have to not jump ahead of myself a little bit here. But uh, um, before we talk about that, it, all this needs to be, I don't know, surrounded and, and uh, hugged and embraced in the grace of Christ. Like whatever, you, you may think, oh, this is condemnatory towards, you know, people that get divorced or something. You know, that's not really where Jesus comes from. I came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. And, you know, the core, the core thing about, about our faith is that uh, God is calling us all who are broken people into his fellowship and to, 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 uh, to be reconciled to him through Christ's blood because we're all broken, we're all fallen. One example of it is, you know, marriage is breaking down. Uh, you know, it's, it's common to the human race, and Jesus died for us all, and so we, when we come to him, we're completely forgiven. Well, so back to the story that we just read, or heard, it's easy to criticize the younger crowd, isn't it? So easy. <laughs> easy targets. And we see them, and some of us who have been around a little bit longer than others, uh, you know, we, we kind of look and say, well, that's not the way we did it when I was, you know, um, Whatever. <laughs> so it's easy to it's easy to criticize these young families 
think it might be my battery. So, um, you know what? I do have these. Ben, I'm going to get you to go see if you can find them in my office. They're double A's. There's a, there's a plastic box in them, and I need two, I think. Let me just check. Yep. So, I think that's what's causing this buzz. Meanwhile, I'll just keep going. Um, uh, so it's helpful to keep in mind the pressures that uh, the families in our day and age and this in society as it stands in the 21st century are under, which most of us, you know, especially our parents and the way we were raised, you know, most of this was foreign to, to them, and it's a little bit... Did you, no, there's a, it's on the, there's a credenza... Lynn's got it. There's a credenza with a plastic box behind my desk. No, behind my chair. If you find something in my office, good luck. I can say that. <laughs> no. <laughs> she says, no. Yeah, so, so things have changed. I mean, the world has changed really remarkably, markedly in the last few decades and uh, the last generation. So for, for starters, economics is a huge uh, culture shifter. Um, things are very expensive and people have certain expectations of what they feel that they need to have to have to get by and look at the price of housing these days oh my gosh hardly any families uh, younger families it is is it the case where they don't both work now that that's a pretty big shift and uh, alternatively no don't throw those down new batteries okay oh no, one fell down right hand beautiful okay I'm going to take a, uh, a short moment for station identification and this will go off no <laughs> You did, they, they didn't hear you say that. But it was suggested that because of my troubles up here that I should have my bulletproof glass back up. And, you know. Yeah, so economics, you know, b both parents pretty much feel like in our world that they, they need to work. When I was growing up, my mom didn't work. How, how many here, their moms didn't work? Like that was, I don't know. It was pretty common uh, and uh, not so much at all anymore. Very, very, very rare. Um, and then there's societal influences, just, just the shift in thinking in our society. Um, you know, it's a huge shift from, from actually getting married first <laughs> to, to, to living together first and maybe getting married. It's huge. Like, I, I don't hardly do any weddings anymore. So that, that's, a, that's a huge shift. And the, the influence of se what, what you might call secular media is, is powerful. Uh, television is... You, is, is you, just permeates our society. But when I was a kid, we didn't even actually even have a TV till I was, I forget, five or six, I think. And then we had three channels, you know, with an antenna if it worked okay. So, and now, oh my gosh, you know, there's just literally hundreds if not thousands of channels that are available to us, plus the internet. So people are just bombarded with the perspective of the world around us. And one of the things about that perspective is it... it, it it idealizes certain, you know, the way people are supposed to be. And this is a huge pressure and very painful for people. Like, men are supposed to be like this. Women are supposed to be like this. And a lot of people are feel, have felt the pressure. You've you got to be a certain size. You've got to, you got to look a certain way. You've got to dress a certain way. Uh, and, you know, that all takes money. <laughs> and so there's all those kinds of pressures. Plus, one of the big stresses of uh, the media, I don't know if it's stress, but it's, it's, just, it's just there is the promiscuous lifestyle of our day. Oh, my gosh. You know, like, I love TV. I like, you know, I love my sitcoms. I've enjoyed The Big Bang, and I've enjoyed Cheers and Friends. But, but they all just take for granted the promiscuous lifestyle. You know, the people, this one sleeps with that one, and then they change it up, and away you go. And, you know, they're great shows, but as, if you're a Christian, you need to kind of hold that out here. This is not the way of Christ. <laughs> no, this is the way of our world as it stands. And maybe it has always been the way of the world, but we're, we're much more aware of it now. Um, 
multiplication of available opportunities and pastimes. <laughs> also, when I was a kid, we had Cubs, which then turned to Scouts, and we had hockey. <laughs> that was pretty much it, as I recall. You know, nowadays, I mean, we got, we got all kinds of stuff, like all kinds of artistic endeavors and possibilities for kids and, you know, like, uh, karate and uh, dance and all kinds of music and choirs and, and, and sports that beyond just hockey. <laughs> so all those, and, and for adults as well. I mean, you, you guys could probably do something pretty much every night of the week. There's, there's, you know, there's things you can get involved in. That didn't used to be available. So there's lots of things that kind of, are, are wonderful, but pull our attention. And also, the, the families nowadays feel like th there's a, a certain pressure. If we don't enroll our kids in everything they can possibly do, we're, you know, we're, we're not going to equip them for life, and we're not going to help them get ahead, and it's a competition that's on. That's a huge stress. Technology. Oh, my goodness. Where do we begin? <laughs> I, aren't they wonderful? Yeah, you know. <laughs> I mean, you got these, everybody's pretty much got the phone. In fact, you know, the, the there's a whole conversation right now about the, uh, the, the fully vaccinated passport that's supposed to show up on people's phones, and what if you don't have one? But what? You don't have a phone? Um, you know, so it's wonderful. You can reach anybody anytime. You can look up. It's a little computer in your pocket. You can, but how many of us are walking around, you know, <laughs> well, maybe we should be talking to each other. And it, it, so it's been wonderful in some ways. For instance, in the middle of COVID, we've been able to, to do services that lots of people have been able to access. And it's kept, you know, kind of helped kept their churches going, which is wonderful. But just remember, don't forget to come back. Just, just, just please. Oh, I'm saying that right to the camera there, just in case there's some, you know, it, that won't be possible. So it's a wonderful thing for now for, for those that maybe can't come out or it's, it's just not safe, they're not able, whatever. Um, but we have to be careful to, to not eschew the possibility of uh, incarnate worship. I mean, Christ came into this world bodily to be with us and personally, and we're called to that, I think, as the ideal way. Um, and, and the last one, but it's just uh, rampant individualism. You know, kind of, there's a whole lot of pressure for us to be, be us, be, be, be you. You, know, you just be you. <laughs> Which, you know, there's, there's a lot of truth to that. I think God wants that. He wants us to be who he, we're really meant to be, but it's, it's under the, I, the, the realization that we are created by him, through him, and for him. And we will we'll only find out who we really are in relationship to God through Jesus Christ. And, you know, as he transforms us and, and heals us of this, the, the, our fallenness and our sinfulness. So just to go after it, it you know, I've got to do everything for me and take care of me first, can often just segue into something that's pretty selfish and self-centered. So there are a ton of new stresses on this generation and pulls and temptations, whatever you want to put. And we need to be extremely gracious and extremely understanding and extremely wise. You know, we don't have many young families or kids in our churches these days. And there, some of the reasons for that are embedded in what I've just said. And our lack of, our lack of wisdom and love and compassion and understanding with respect to what people are going through. So just, just pause for thought and pause for prayer, I guess, uh, because we want to reach. You know, our world still needs Christ. They still need grace. They still need to know their God. Um, and, you know, how do we reach? So let's take a, a, you know, a little bit of a look at this passage. Uh, and this is basically about family. So the first chunk, if you recall, was on marriage. <laughs> and the second chunk was on kids. Now, when I think about marriage and then I think about kids it strikes me as being about family. So these two are right beside each other in the scripture. Uh, so, so basically this is Jesus' teaching about family, or, or some of his teaching about family. And, and it starts with this whole conversation about divorce. So he gets asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? It doesn't say anything about wives divorcing their husbands at this point. It, it, apparently that's possible. It says in verse 12, he says, if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Anyway, uh, what he's, Jesus asks, they ask him a question, so Jesus asks them a question. It's the way he does things. What did Moses command you? He replied. 
And they, he knew they knew, but they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Now, whatever else you may hear from this passage, let, this, let it be known that this is kind of the core thing here. That Jesus is, is helping them to realize there's something really wrong with the way they were doing stuff. They had a, they had a system in which a, a, a man could just write his wife a certificate of divorce and send her a packing. Bye-bye, next, you know. And, uh, oh my gosh. And, and not only is that super unfair, but also it, uh, you know, it's destructive for, for women, especially in that day and age. They really probably would, would have a hard time. They'd be taken for themselves, probably could not get married again. They would be uh, kind of considered, uh, what's the word? Outcasts, in a sense, as far as the marriage world went. And uh, it's unlikely they would be able to get married again. So in a society which really, you know, prided itself on marriage and children, lots of, lots of children, uh, that was, a, that was a, a pretty tough one. So Jesus is actually saying things to protect women in his day. So that's largely what this is about. But uh, uh, he, says, he says to them, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. Because your hearts were hard. And he sums things up pretty well right there, because basically that's, uh, uh, the human situation is, we got hard hearts. We don't start that way. You know, we start with relatively soft hearts, tender hearts. A a child has a fairly tender heart. Which we're going to get to something about that in a bit, but, um, and then, and they love easily. They're affectionate readily, right? They hug you quickly. And then what happens? We grow older. You know, we have this, and then you get to school. Remember we just saw the, the, in the, in the, the, um, the mission picture, the little, the little boy was a boy or a little girl that was, uh, wanted to play and she's kind of too, getting blind and uh, they, they wouldn't play with her and they were, they teased her and called her names. Well, I mean, that, that starts to harden your heart. And all of us have had experiences like that where friends turned on us, even as children. And then, you know, we, we, we love people and it didn't work out. And our hearts have become callous over the, over the ages, over the, the decades. And only by grace and by God's intervention in our hearts and lives do we get those things really healed, deeply healed. Because we can forgive people and we can learn to love again. But, uh, you know, our hearts are hardened by sin. Sin does that. The, fa- the fallenness of the human race. Well, why are people so, you know, tribalistic? We talked about this recently. And that war with each other. And why is there so much violence? That's hard-heartedness. That's why Christ came, to, to heal us and forgive us and change us through the cross. So, but he just says, it's because your hearts are hard. But, <laughs> at the beginning of creation, so now Jesus kind of defines marriage and, and he goes back to creation he, go, he goes back and he quotes Genesis chapter 2. He says, From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Straight out of Genesis 2. And so Jesus is saying, you know, in the beginning, God made it like this, and this was the ideal plan. And notably, I don't know if, how many of you got an Anglican past. I know some of you that are watching do. And if you had a, a classic Anglican ceremony... Uh, for your for your wedding, there's a line in it, something like this: that, that God instituted marriage in the time of man's innocency. Okay, uh, so in the time of our innocency, in other words, before sin came in, before we were fallen, it was part of His good created plan. I mean, lots of other things came in later to kind of wreck it, like Christ coming into the world to die for us was it was a you know a plan to 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 bring back the world to his original beauty. But, uh, but marriage was, was in the beginning, before the fall. Interesting. Uh, and the two will become one flesh. So, so then Jesus does a, th- a thing here, which is like uh, he was a rabbi, and what rabbis would do would be quote a little bit of scripture and then give it a little commentary, sometimes a long commentary. <laughs> but Jesus gives it a little one here. It says, so they are no, it says, the two will become one flesh. So Jesus' comment is, that, so they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one pull apart. So that's his, his little comment. I, I, when I've, I've done, I used to do weddings. 
officiate at weddings. But, you know, like we've mentioned, not as many people getting married. And uh, there's a lot of other ways to get married. And, um, but w- when I first came here, the first bunch of years, I'd often have 25 weddings. You know, I remember counting. Uh, 25, 26 weddings every year. <clears throat> One time I had four in a day. And then I started forgetting people's names and thought, no, this is, no, it's not, this is not good. So, but when I would talk with the couples, uh, I would say, well, how about we read this passage, you know? And we usually did. I said, because this is the, the lock-in passage. The two shall become one. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> and usually they went for it because they wanted to be locked in. Um, so, <laughs> so, so, so that's, that's how Jesus kind of defines and describes and, and uh, honors marriage. And then, it's, and then there's this little passage that's tough for us where he goes in and he's with the disciples in the, in the house and they, they say, what's going on? What, what are you talking about? He says, anyone who divorces his wife marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. So that, that, this is, I think, the hard thing that Ben was mentioning in the beginning. This is, this is harsh, harsh to our modern ears, for sure. Uh, but basically, he's reinforcing the importance of marriage. And he's using almost hyper... He does use a lot of colorful language and hyperbolic. It, it, you'll you'll know, notice that he, he doesn't hold back. He tells them like he calls them like he sees them. Uh, but elsewhere, for instance, in the in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, "If someone, if a man looks at a woman to lust after, her, he's committed adultery already. That's adultery." But by the way, I like to just not let the women off the hook. I believe that implies if if a woman looks at a man to lust after him, uh, she has committed adultery in her heart. Not that, I don't know, we're different, but yeah. (laughs) So, you know, that's pretty across-the-board carte blanche uh, coloring the human race is broken. So this is kind of another way where he's doing that. Um, So, and But the point is, what is Jesus' attitude, if you will, to those who are are divorced? And an amazing story that actually speaks to this is in John chapter 4 where Jesus encounters the Samaritan woman at the well. <clears throat> and uh, if you recall this story, uh, it's, first of all, his disciples are just astonished that he's talking to a Samaritan and to a woman. <laughs> but he's just doing it. They're having this great chat. And he, he says, you go, go get your husband, and we'll have a chat with him too. She says, I, I don't have a husband. He says, that's right. You've had five husbands, and the one that you're with now is not your husband. So Jesus is loving her. He's having this wonderful conversation with her. He knows her background and where she's coming from. He uses her to, to be his connecting point with the Samaritan village. And he stays there for a few days, and they're all in wonder because the, the Messiah has come and visited them. And she, this fallen woman, I don't know how, what you want to say, multiply divorced woman, is his, his connection point with them. So, he, you know, he's so uh, gracious and loving. And... That's kind of the story we need to take away and, 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 and uh, hold on to. As followers, followers of Jesus, we need to be like him in that perspective. Our first task in connecting with our hurting, confused world is to represent to them the forgiving, compassionate, patient, sacrificial, understanding love of Jesus, who values everyone, you know, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter how messed up we are from the eyes of others, we're all messed up. <laughs> and we're in need of grace and healing and his love. Um, and he loves each one and knows each one so much deep, more deeply and, and uh, richly than any of us ever can. So, but that all being said, Jesus rightly upholds the sanctity and significance of marriage between a man and a woman as God ordained and thus to be defended, in my view. So <clears throat> the next section is about kids, just briefly. And, you know, they're bringing the children to Jesus. This is this famous story. And the disciples are trying to drive them away. And Jesus is indignant. You love that word, indignant. Isn't that a great word? He's like, what are you thinking, you guys? <laughs> you idiots. <laughs> Don't, why are you, you know, let them come to me, he says. Uh, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the, the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. 
And, and Jesus' love and regard for children is, is, you know, is famous, really, because of this. Uh, we almost sang that song, When mothers of Salem their children brought to Jesus. And the only place I can find it is in the oldest United Church hymn, hymnary. So if you know that, <laughs> that's where you, you know it from. And basically, Jesus is telling us, children are to be loved, they're to be respected, they're even to be studied. Because, you know, we're to, we, we've lost so much uh, that children have that we don't, that we need to study them and learn how to be childlike. <laughs> Because they're they often guileless. Um, they're not, especially the littler they are. You know, they have the you know chocolate all over their face, and the, I didn't I didn't eat any cookies. Yeah, right. <laughs> they're they're genuine. They're they, they 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 just be themselves naturally. They don't pretend. And as the years go by, we tend tend to become pretentious, and not be who we are. They're spontaneous, they're joyful, they're affectionate, all that kind of... They're, they're curious as all get out. So in all those kinds of things, not the tantrum in the super, supermarket so much, <laughs> we need to be learned to be like children again. And, you know, so they're to be treated with great dignity and led by us and taught by us with humility as their servants, not as their lords. And... They need to be allowed to come to Jesus. Suffer the little children to come to me, says Jesus. Don't get in the way. <laughs> Don't prevent. Don't prohibit. Make it easy. You know, make, 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 make the path play, uh, easy for them to come to the Savior who they need to know. So this, in the first instance, is, of course, the mandate for all parents. But after that, it's for all grandparents and grand, great uncles and aunts and and teachers, and anywhere you have kids in your neighborhood that you're, or whatever, that you're in touch with them, it's a huge, huge responsibility that Jesus has entrusted to us, who are adults. Families are the foundation of relationship, foundation of psychological health, and the foundation of society. Families matter a lot. God set them up. Jesus the Son backs them up and holds them up for us, we would do well, by God's grace, to do the same. Let's pray.